Chapter 10. Arrive in Azerlin. The group spent the next few days trekking through the desert, wandering from watering hole to watering hole, following Rowan's map and compass and his incessant pace until one afternoon they found themselves walking up to the broken fence line of an old farmhouse that lay decimated against the sands of the surrounding desert, marking the very edge of the Azerlin city ruins. The wooden fence stood in jagged, jarring pylons held together with long, rusted nails. Bark leaned against one of these posts as they came closer to the fence. It crumpled under his weight, and shiny blue beetles spilled out in large swaths underneath him as he fell down upon them. Oh, holy hell, yelled Barkland as he fell on the crawling mass. Rose and Samuel ran over to help him up, but Barkland had already jumped up and was furiously brushing himself off, jumping from leg to leg, making sure that he was completely beetle-free. The beetles, completely unfazed by Barkland's intrusion, milled about the ruined post, turning the sawdust that used to be the post between large black pincers. They're quite big, aren't they? said Rose, bending to study the bugs. Do you want me to scorch them? asked Jibria, helpfully. No thanks, Jibri. They're not hurting anyone, said Samuel. Speak for yourself, said Barkland, shivering. Ugh. Not a fan of bugs, are you, Barky? asked Averly. Barkland shook his head. No, not in particular, said Barkland. That's too bad. The beetles can be quite tasty, said Rowan, bending down and picking one up. Rowan held the beetle out to Barkland. They're quite juicy once you get beyond the hard shell, said Rowan. Barkland gagged. No thanks. That's fine, thank you, said Barkland. Oh, he's going green, said Rose. No? No matter, said Rowan, pretending to pop the beetle in his mouth, but flinging it behind his head instead. Barkland's eyes opened wide in shock. Rowan chewed, smiling wide. Oh, that's very good, said Rowan, swallowing audibly. Barkland grimaced and groaned. I think I'll wait over there for a bit until you're ready to keep heading on. Don't think I can be around you in your lunch for a minute, said Barkland. Rose and the other smiled. He didn't really eat it, Barky, said Rose, pointing to the beetle that Rowan had tossed over his shoulder. It was crawling away from the group through the sand. Barkland offered a wan smile. Oh, that's good. Thought you ate it for a moment. That's a good trick, that, said Barkland. He moved away from the group and sat down and put his head in his paws and began taking deep breaths. He really didn't like seeing you eat that bug, said Rose, looking at Rowan. No, he did not, said Rowan, who shrugged his shoulders. The group went and sat with Barkland until he was ready to leave, after which they got up and continued on their way into the city ruins. From the upper floor of the ruins of a farmhouse, a pair of ethereal blue eyes watched them go and turned away as they made their way around the corner of the sandy road and disappeared from view. The group followed the road down towards the center of the town until they found a hillside clearing that gave them a clear view of the most of the town's ruins, and Rowan let them camp for the day. They set up camp quickly and found it still running well and gathered water from it. Once their tents were set up and the fire was lit from some dilapidated wood pulled from the nearest fence they found, they got to work figuring out how to best explore the city. Rowan laid out his map of the area on the ground in front of him and smoothed it with both paws. He marked it where they had come into the town with his pencil and made a line following the path that they had traveled that day and circled where they were currently resting. This is where we are, said Rowan, tapping the point on the map he had just circled. Barkland looked over the map. There's very little to work with here. Why is the map so lacking in detail, asked Barkland. There have been very few successful trips to this area. Most animals that come back here are looters, and they never seem to make it back with any successful information, said Rowan. So where do you think we should go to look for the Amberstones, asked Rose, as she bit into a large chunk of dried carrot. We'll have to break the city into segments and go segment by segment until we find them. If that doesn't work, we'll have to do more research and move to the next area, said Rowan. Okay, so we'll start with this area over here, said Samuel, pointing to the left side of the map, just above where they were. That'll work. It shouldn't take more than a couple of days to search the town if we're methodical about the process, said Rowan. The group sat and ate their lunch, studying the wind as it whipped sandy trails through the streets of the city. This place it must have been something when it was up and running, said Samuel. What happened to it? asked Averly, turning to Rowan. Nobody really knows for sure. It was a bustling city one day, and then the next it was completely empty. The surrounding towns sent in envoys to search, but they turned up nothing. There were no animals left within the city limits whatsoever. They think that the king at some time was practicing some particularly bad magic, and it may have had something to do with his subjects' disappearances, said Rowan thoughtfully. That's horrible. They didn't find anything at all, asked Rose. No, not a thing, apparently. There were things like half-eaten meals left on tables, and it was as though many animals had just disappeared right in the middle of whatever it was they were doing, said Rowan. Do you want to start searching today so we can see what it's like, see if the buildings can hold our weight, that sort of thing, asked Barkland, pointing to the nearest two-story house down the hill where they had pulled the fence post from to build their fire. That's a good idea. We should go over how to communicate while searching if we can, said Rowan. Finish your food and we'll go over there and see what it's like, shall we? They ate their rations and threw the paper wrappings in the fire to burn away. Once they were ready, Rowan walked them over to the house and had them 
weighed outside while he checked inside. He tapped the floor with the staff to see if it was rotten, and finding it dense enough to stand on, walked back to the group. Okay, so here's how we do this. Walk where I walk and do your best to balance your weight. There's no telling where the weak points in the floor are, and we don't want any one of you falling through the floor and getting hurt. Got it? Asked Ron. Everybody nodded. They lined up and began to enter the house. The house was arid and dusty inside. The hinges that held the door had broken ages ago and the door was fallen, laying haphazardly against the hallway as they came in. The deep-set windows cut in the walls lit in the afternoon light, which was obscured by the sheer amount of dust in the air that hung lazily and moved around them with each step deeper into the house. There was little sign of looting and the wares inside the house looked in surprisingly good condition, that they looked old and they appeared as though they were untouched and undamaged by the elements. Rowan continued to test the floor with his staff. It was solid. The ground was hard wood, packed with sand and that had drifted in through the open front door. I think we can spread out a bit if you want. Just be careful, said Rowan. The group spread out, going throughout the first floor of the house. It's a bit weird seeing how nothing has moved for the last century or so, said Averly. Right. You would think that this would have been a looter's paradise at some point, said Samuel. I wonder what keeps them away, asked Rose. Wiping one claw along the edge of the table she stood next to, leaving a clear path of wood shining through behind her. There's some lovely pieces here, she said, eyeing the table. Maybe it's traveling through the desert, offered Barklin. Looters don't mind hauling through the sand, said Ron. Well, I have no idea then, said Barklin. Averly moved from the dining room into the kitchen. Look, there's dishes in the sink. They really did leave in a hurry, said Averly. The others came into the kitchen. I wonder what would make an animal drop what they're doing like that and leave, asked Barklin. Me too, said Rose. They walked through the kitchen and back out into the hallway to the bottom of the staircase, where a faded painting crusted with sand rested on the floor. Barkland bent and picked it up, gently dusting the sand away from the painting's surface. It showed a family of four armadillos, two parents and two young children. The young boy wore a matching suit to the father and the girl a matching blue dress to the mother. They were all smiling. That was us, said a voice from behind the group. Barkland jumped and almost dropped the painting, but called himself. Who said that? asked Barkland, wheeling around to face the voice. I did, said the distant bodied voice as a small ethereal blue shape rolled out of the wall and popped up behind them. A small armadillo sprang up from the ball and smiled up at them. It was a small girl in a light blue dress similar to the one in the painting staring up at them. The wall behind her could be seen showing through her. That's my family you're holding, said the armadillo pointing at the painting. Barkland blinked looking at the painting and looking at the ghostly armadillo before him. And that's you, isn't it? asked Rose pointing at the portrait of the little girl. The young armadillo nodded. Uh huh. This was our special portrait. It was a big deal. Daddy made sure we were all well behaved for it because it cost so much. I got a new dolly for it for being so good. Do you want to see it? asked the armadillo. What's your name, youngling? asked Rowan. Elsie, said the young girl. It's nice to meet you, Elsie. Where are your parents, child? asked Rowan. Oh, they'll come out tonight like everyone else. I don't know why, but I get to be up whenever I want, and most of the others come out at night. It's just how it is. I just spend my day exploring and playing games, so it's not so bad, said Elsie. What games do you play, asked Rose? Well, most games involve exploring, but there's not much to do by yourself. Though I stay away from the palace, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Mom and Dad said to stay away from there, too, so I do. They say that's why everyone has to stay up all night, all the time, that it's the king's fault, so I stay away from there, said Elsie pleasantly. Rowan looked at the others. That may be where the Amberstones are being kept, said Ron. Rose and the others nodded. Where is the palace, child? Would you be able to sh tell us, please? asked Rowan. Elsie nodded. Only if you play with me, though, said Elsie. I really want to play hide-and-seek. I'm really good at it now, and it would be fun to play with someone new. All the others get boring, since we can all do the same tricks. Do you want to play with me? Of course we'll play with you, child, said Rowan. Elsie's eyes lit up with a faint blue light, and she shimmered slightly. That's great, Elsie squealed. How about I count to twenty, and you go out and hide somewhere upstairs and we'll play and then you can tell us about the palace a bit okay honey said rose that'll be great said elsie rose covered her eyes with her paws and began counting to 20 elsie rolled up into a ball and bounced up the stairs giggling did we really just meet a ghost asked samuel you have the embodiment of a pure fire magic sitting in a trinket around your belt and you're surprised that ghosts exist said averly good point said samuel 20 here i come elsie said rose and she bounded up the stairs to find her Rose searched the rooms upstairs, going from room to room until she was sure that Elsie wasn't in any of them. I can't find her anywhere. She's not in any of these rooms, said Rose, perplexed. Elsie giggled. I'm here. You just have to find me, said Elsie. 
Rose searched the rooms again, checking under the ancient beds and in each room until she was absolutely sure that Elsie couldn't be in any of them. Elsie, where are you? I can't find you, said Rose, flummoxed, raising her arms over her head in mock frustration. Elsie giggled loudly and rolled out from between the wall of the hallway at Rose's feet. Gotcha, yelled Elsie and fell on the floor, giggling to herself wildly. Oh, you did get me. How was I going to find you in such a clever hiding place, asked Rose. I told you I was good at playing games, said Elsie. You really are, said Rose, smiling at the ghost child. Elsie smiled up at her. Rose stuck her arm out towards her. Now, do you want to come down and help us out with what we need? asked Rose. Elsie placed her palm in Rose's paw. Rose shivered. Elsie's skin was cold and made her paw tingle. They walked down the staircase and to the others. Did you have fun, youngling? asked Rowan. I sure did. I stumped her, said Elsie excitedly. She got you, did she? asked Samuel, smiling. She hid in the wall, said Rose, nudging him in the ribs. Master hide-and-seeker, isn't she? said Barklin. Averly laughed. Elsie beamed up at them. Are you able to help us now? asked Rowan. Sure. I won't be able to go inside with you because Mum and said not to, but I can show you where the palace is from here if you like, said Elsie. That would be fantastic of you, said Rowan. I'll have to be back before dark before the rest of my family wakes up. They'll be worried if I'm not here when they get up. They were the last time I was out exploring and they woke up. I got in trouble, said Elsie. We're just going to walk over there and mark it on our map and then walk back, said Rowan, tapping on the map pack attached to his belt. Oh, okay. It shouldn't take too long then. Do you want to get going now? Asked Elsie. Sure thing, child, said Rowan. Elsie walked them to the front door and out into the street. Rowan stopped her. Let me, me mark on our map and check my compass where we are so I can find our way back out, said Rowan. Oh, I can mark the map for you if you want, said Elsie. Rowan blinked, looking shocked. You can touch things, asked Samuel. If I concentrate for a bit, yes, I can move things too. It just takes a little bit of concentration, said Elsie. Well, I'll be. That's amazing, said Chibri. Why is that? asked Elsie. The group looked at one another. Well, because you know, said Chibri. Know what? asked Elsie, looking worried. You're a ghost, Elsie, said Chibri. Samuel put his paw up to his eyes and scrunched them closed in frustration. Chibri, said Samuel. What? She must know by now, said Chibri. You can't be dead for a hundred years and not know you're a ghost, right? said Chibri. You mean I'm dead? asked Elsie, ghostly tears sprouting at the edge of her eyes. Well, yes, child, I'm afraid so, said Ron. Elsie wiped her eyes and smiled a devilish grin. That's okay. Mum and Dad explained it when it first happened. That's why they're so mad at the king, because we don't get to rest. I've known that for ages. How do you think I got to know to hide in walls and hide and seek? Living animals don't get to do fun stuff like that, do they? said Elsie. The group nodded. Let's get going to the palace then, shall we? asked Elsie and began marching off. She's awfully well adjusted for a child, said Chibri. She's older than most of us combined, said Rowan. Chibri faltered. You're right, said Chibri and fell in line as they headed towards the palace. It took about an hour of walking through the decrepit town until they reached the wrought metal gate surrounding the palace. The palace was huge against the late afternoon sky. Elsie skipped along in front of the group, chatting the whole way, pointing out what each building used to be and who used to run that. That used to be the textile merchant. He had the prettiest fabrics you'd ever seen, said Elsie, pointing to a building that had fallen into itself years ago. That's very interesting, Elsie, said Ron. Elsie had been a fount of knowledge about the town that any historian would have loved to have known had any been available at the time, but she had been speaking non-stop for the last hour and it was wearing Rowan thin. Well, here we are. These are the palace gates. You should be able to get right in. They've been unlocked for decades as far as I know, said Elsie. Brooklyn walked up to the nearest gate and tried to swing it open. The hinge had long ago rusted shut. He put his weight against it. Come and help me with this, would you? asked Barklin. Samuel and Averly walked over and shouldered against the gate, both pressing into it. It creaked in protest against their weight, and the hinges promptly snapped. The door slammed into the sand, leading into the courtyard with a wump as it impacted with the ground. But well, at least we'll be able to get in pretty easily, said Samuel, dusting his paws off. Rowan stood bending over his map, drawing his last line leading to where the palace door was, and let it slide back into place against his waist with a flick of his wrist. Since that's what you needed, shall we start heading back? The town will start waking up soon, and you'll want to see that, said Elsie. All right, child, let's start heading back then, folks, said Rowan. They turned around where they were they were, and started heading back down the street where they had come from and headed back towards Elsie's house and their camp on the hill above it. It was turning to dusk when they arrived, and Elsie skipped up past the front door, leaning against the wall of her house. You should be waking up any moment. I want you to meet them, said Elsie, disappearing into the house. The group followed her into the house and clambered into the ancient sitting room. They sat in the small living room full of a century-old couch and sitting chairs covered in a fine layer of sand. Brooklyn made himself busy and pulled the cushions from the couch and dusted the sand from them onto the floor. He did the same for the two sitting chairs adjoining the couch and tentatively sat down. It creaked warmly 
it creaked worryingly, but held his weight. They really made things very well back then, didn't they? Said Barkland, satisfied. Early sat down next to him, but the couch protested. The couch protested, but stayed steady. They sure did, said Averly. Rose squeezed in between them. It's still comfortable, said Rose, surprised. Samuel and Rowan took one of the remaining seats each, resting gingerly until they were sure their chairs could handle the added weight, and then, sure they could hold each of them, got comfortable. Mom, Dad, Reuben, we have guests. Time to get up, yelled Elsie, running throughout the house at full speed. She ran up the stairs, repeating herself. I wonder how you wake a ghost up, asked Rose. From a dead sleep, said Barkland dryly. Averly snorted and laughed. Chibri laughed too. Samuel gave her a tight look. What, Sam? It was funny, said Chibri, shrugging. Elsie bounded down the stairs and came into the sitting room. They're waking up. They'll be down shortly. Reuben is the first one up, usually, said Elsie. That's nice. It'll be neat to meet your family, said Rose. Elsie smiled at her and sat cross-legged on the floor in the corner. They sat for a while, waiting for the rest of the Armadillo family to get up until a voice called down from up the stairs. Elsie, what's this about guests? asked the deep voice. That's Daddy. Let me go get him. He's usually groggy when he wakes up, said Elsie. Daddy, we have guests. They're travelers from outside the city, said Elsie. Running out of the room soundlessly and up the stairs. Travelers, asked the voice groggily. Are they looters come to looking for something to steal? No, no, they're nothing like that. At least I don't think so. They like to play games. They'll tell you who they are, said Elsie, pulling on the arm of the gruff armadillo as he started to walk down the stairs. He walked into the living room and stared blankly at the travelers for a moment. So I just signed up for Anchor's... Uh, funding platform for the podcasters it seems like a better deal than patreon at the moment so i would ask that you click the button that says donate and maybe donate a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars a month to us so that we can keep going and i can produce almost daily or daily podcasts or more than the way that i've been going and i'll produce book after book after book after book and then I'll read through them and I just I'll keep doing that until there won't I can't see an end to it it's so much fun it really is so please go to anchor.fm slash divergent mind and click the donate button and that'll help me out a whole bunch thank you so much Jay Please visit anchor.fm slash divergentmind to leave a message so that I may get back to you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Hi, everybody. So I've made a new store called animalquest.shop, and I made my first shirt, Barkland Reading, at the Amberstone's house, and I would ask that you go and buy those there. I'll make a few bucks each time you buy something from there. And I have men, women's, baby clothing, and buttons, as well as other accessories, including dog bandanas, which I think are pretty cool. And I'll be adding more merch every week or two for that store as the stories progress and the sequels are written and read. I'll do the same for Divergent Mind. The link again is animalquest.shop. The link for Divergent Mind will be divergentmind.shop as well. Thank you so much. Jay. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that I have a YouTube channel called Taught Myself and that I've decided to start selling merch already with a phrase that my brother showed me saying my disability is invisible of which I made a hat for myself. So I decided to make hats, shirts, hoodies uh, for both men and women on Spreadshirt.com. All you have to do is search for My Disability is Invisible. It's in green, and that's mine. You'll know it's me because when you click the sale icon, the same little Divergent Mind icon comes up. And I hope you support me. I make about $5 per shirt or per sale. Everything else goes to Spreadshirt. But that's okay, because it's still a better deal than a lot of other places. And I really hope you'll support me. Come check me out on the YouTube. Teach me how to do that properly, so I can have a community there too. And I await your response. Have a lovely day. 
Jay. Hey, people, take a listen to the Divergent Mind podcast. You get both insight into living with a mental, a serious mental illness and get to listen to a lovely tale about a journey cute little animals need to take. Don't miss out. And remember, divergent minds don't need to think alike. Please go to ratethispodcast.com slash divergentmind and tell me what you think. Thank you very much. Yours truly, Jay.